Welcome back. Today I would like to have a very brief discussion on the anti-domestic violence bill that passed through Parliament last week after a 78-minute filibuster by MP Philip Davis. This is a typical Friday bill, if I might be uh, able to, to say that. It uh, basically comes with a worthy sentiment. You know, who can possibly be uh, against trying to stop uh, violence against women. Nobody I'm aware of, I'm not aware of anybody who wants to argue that people should be violent towards women and girls. Of course not. And so, because the title of the bill has about combating violence against women, uh, then it, it uh, presumes that if you, if, as long as you support that premise, then you must support this particular bill. Uh, and therefore, if you uh, oppose this bill, it means that you must be in favour, uh, as it follows, of violence against women and children. Uh, now, that's the kind of level of debate I would expect from the morons on Twitter, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I still live in hope uh, that we might actually have better quality debate than that in this House, although uh, my experience is that it doesn't actually get much better normally, but I'm, I'm going to live in hope and try again that we can actually have a sensible debate about these matters rather than the level of debate that we get used to on social media. Now, I have a fundamental objection to the whole premise that we only need to deal with violence against women. I can't... I can't... Um, um, no. Uh, it was worth thinking about for a few seconds. I'm sure the Honourable Lady would uh, appreciate it. Now, the bill being debated, or partly debated before Mr Davis intervened for so long, was to require the United Kingdom to ratify the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, the Istanbul Convention, and for connected purposes. The reason Mr Davis filibustered for as long as he did, and got heckled, and even people victims of domestic violence up in the galley turning their backs on him, was because he wanted to argue against the very gendered nature of this. I personally have an issue with this, because it wants us to essentially to abide Europe's Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, of course separating the two entirely, which means that violence against women means that violence against men is being ignored, and domestic violence, while not gendered, is mostly going to be leaning towards helping women and not men. The usual men are perpetrators, women are victims. What this also means is that we in the United Kingdom, who have current statistics on domestic violence within our own country, are having ours devalued by that of continental Europe. I'm not saying for a second here that any one country is to blame for this, but I do think that if you're going to go ahead and make us abide by European rules on this, at least allow us to rectify it to accommodate for male victims in our country, because we are not taking our victims seriously. And based on the fact that the very first violence-related study I find on the EU website is with relation to violence against women, I don't think you are either. Maybe you should start taking male victims seriously. I don't know how other cultures within other countries in continental Europe deal with male victims, or whether they have not got to the point where they can talk about it, but in this country we do at least talk about it. And we're hopefully going to amend this enough, give the male victims of DV in this country the support they need and deserve, because they do not get that at this present time. Our politicians are supposed to represent their constituents, not their gender, and yet we constantly have gendered language used in Parliament, constantly referencing female victims of violence, and the only MP that talks about male violence is getting vilified for it. Granted, he's an absolute prick, but he raises an issue. Who cares about his character? The issue he raises is serious. The numbers are proven. And also, we talk about not teaching men to attack women, but we also see in current statistics that female victims of domestic violence with a female partner is on the rise as well. So tell me, why are we not teaching women not to attack as well? Because surely this also skews the results as well. Politicians, as I said earlier, are meant to represent their constituents and not their gender. But they are so biased that their political careers are more important. It's why we're having so much hassle trying to enact Article 50. Most of the politicians in the Commons don't actually want to leave the European Union, but rather than act in their constituents' best interests, they act in their career's best interests. It's why we've had the issues with judges as well. Now, another one of my main pet peeves about this is the interpretation of the law. Because if you have a male victim of domestic violence, is the law going to treat the female attacker as seriously as it would that of a male attacker? 
attacker? And the answer is no, because it all comes down to interpretation. Oh, I ranted a little bit there. Now, just before we take a look at the ratification bill itself and some parts of the Istanbul Convention that are relevant to the points in that bill, I want to have a little look and also show you the parliamentary process and progress of a bill going through Parliament. Because this bill, as of the 16th of December, which is when I first noticed this to begin with as it was reported, some misogynist Philip Davis, filibustering essentially, is on its second reading through the Commons. The next stage is the committee stage. Now this offers opportunity, which I doubt politicians will take, because as I mentioned earlier, politicians don't really care so much about equality. More pushing, very biased agendas, which in this case, much like the bill's title itself, will not do anything to help men. And this can be further supported when you think that people like Jess Phillips are involved in this. And we all know Jess Phillips from the International Men's Day of 2015, don't we? Uh, we've had an, uh, an annual debate, and, and uh, in the last few years, uh, this committee has granted one. In fact, I think I was on the committee uh, when it did grant um, the debate for International Women's Day, uh, and, and that's been held every single year. And so I thought that in the spirit of gender equality, it would only be right uh, to, uh, to have a debate to commemorate International Men's Day, which conveniently conveniently falls on uh, Thursday the 19th of November, which uh, is a date when you, you may or may not have some time to allocate, uh, so it will be very fitting. Um, because, of course, not only do, um, do we have International Women's Day, we also have women and equality questions every month in the Chamber, which we don't have for men. So the opportunity for men to raise issues that are important to them is very limited. And just to give you a flavour, Mr Chairman, of the type of things that may may come up and which will be part of International Men's Day, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why it's so humorous, but to discuss issues such as men's shorter life expectancy, uh, wider male uh, health issues, many of which go uh, unreported be through embarrassment of, of men to sort of go along and talk about these things, uh, the high uh, suicide rate amongst men, uh, propensity for violence against men, there's many male victims of domestic violence, again, as something that goes very much unreported because of lots of embarrassment about it. Uh, you have to excuse me for laughing, that the idea that men don't have the opportunity to ask questions in this place is a frankly laughable thing, as I say, as this, as the only woman on this committee. thing. And so, the, in the fight for equality, I'm not sure the men on this list necessarily have that much to fight for. But if you are somebody of the more optimistic persuasion, when it gets to committee, there is a tiny chance that men's issues and the statistics showing male victims are on the rise here could be raised and possibly added as an amendment. But I am not holding out much hope for such a thing. I have a sneaky feeling men's issues will be ignored much like they usually are. There'll be no funding for any kind of resources that they need to deal with this. Instead, we will continue to have to put up with what is in the Istanbul Convention that portrays men as the perpetrators and women as the perpetual victims, and that men must be re-educated at all costs, and that men must learn their privilege that society has given them at all opportunities. And by the way, these are not assertions. Everything I have said are in all publications on the Istanbul Convention, in the articles themselves, even in the shorter hand version. It's not hard to find. I'm going to put some of it on the screen now, of course, as I'm speaking. It's right there. Please feel free to either pause and read each section in turn, or go to the Istanbul Convention site and go to the Convention in Brief, which is under the section of About the Convention. Okay, so now that I have addressed, in some sense, that Istanbul Convention and Jess Phillips and how unlikely it is that anything will actually be done, I do want to quickly get to the part of the bill that bothers me so much, and it's subsection E. The measures taken by Her Majesty's Government to ensure that the United Kingdom is and remains compliant with the Istanbul Convention, including but not limited to measures to protect women against violence and prevent, prosecute and eliminate violence against women and domestic violence, contribute to the elimination of discrimination against women, promote equality between women and men and empower women, protect and assist victims of violence against women and domestic violence, promote international cooperation against these forms of violence violence and provide support and assistance to organisations and law enforcement agencies to cooperate in order to adopt an integrated approach to eliminating violence against women and 
domestic violence. Now, unless I have totally misinterpreted something in that area, I feel like there's zero mention of men, and I, I'm not an MRA, but I feel this is ridiculous, and it is such a big point that they are overlooked, and for what reason? Our statistics in our country, because we're not European, we are British, our statistics do not shine a favourable light on women with regards to domestic violence. That's not to say that they are the main problem. Of course not. Violence as a whole is bad, and of course women are still the majority of the victims. Let's ignore for a second gay relationships, because... But if we treat this as a European bill across such a large expanse, then we're still perpetuating this ridiculous progressive narrative that doesn't work. There are some parts of, for example, Sweden, which is considered a very feminist country, certainly in the south of Sweden, where there is a higher rate of domestic violence that is borderline 50-50 male and female victims. I wonder what's services are available to those guys that are victims, because I can't imagine it's much within the feminist utopia that is Swedenistan. Another gripe I have with this bill is that it is a European bill, and we are a country that has recently, well not so recently, voted out of the European Union, meaning we are adopting European law and policy still. I would like to believe this could be put on hold while we start to get into the place where we could enact Article 50 and worm our way out of this system, eventually if we're allowed to, if the less than lovely people in Parliament can pull their thumbs out and do what the people voted for. Then again, with such a divide, I guess, they're going to fight. That's a different conversation for a very different time, although I do find it fair. No, 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 another time for that. This was just a rant from myself because I don't like the very gendered language that still features in our politics, and I love British politics. I love it. I really do, but I do not like the fact that we continually use this bias and it still gets through almost unchallenged. If Philip Davis hadn't, and yes, he's a prick, I know he's a prick. I really do. If he hadn't brought it up, I wouldn't have noticed. For that, thank you, Philip Davis because it shines a light on something that, while it seems to be, the Istanbul Convention that is, something of a noble cause, it excludes a gender by name, which is a problem, because the language then becomes ambiguous enough that people can interpret it in such a way that men aren't really considered victims. Thank you all for listening, and I promise the next video you see is a proper video, not me <sighs> ranting.